Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we examine promising breakthroughs in tech and how they're affecting consumers. In California, we see how robots are helping one restaurant bridge a growing labor gap. And in Washington, we discover a new, more eco-friendly cup of coffee. But we begin with a problem facing many electric car drivers, too few reliable charging stations. David Schechter heads to California, the state with the most EVs, to see how motorists are managing the issue. When you're in California doing a story about electric cars, you gotta rent an electric car, and go for a cruise. Ten miles an hour on the freeway. Not exactly what I had in mind. Unlike the speed of traffic in Los Angeles, the sale of electric vehicles in the U.S. is really moving. Last year, Americans bought 1.4 million of them. More electric vehicles means fewer greenhouse gas emissions that warm our planet. But there's a downside. There are not enough publicly available electric chargers to juice all those cars up. So I've got an app. I'm gonna find us a charger. Okay. That means in California, the state with the most EVs, finding a charger that's working and also available yeah, someone's in it. can be a challenge. They're all in use. It's definitely blocked. There are no chargers here. One way to address the EV charging gap is better maintenance of the chargers we do have. Charger that you thought you were gonna to use to refuel your vehicle is actually inoperable. So one of the- That's a problem. That's a problem, <laughs> right? That's a, that's a huge problem. Walter Thorne is with a small company called Charger Help. They train workers to service a variety of charging equipment owned by different companies. And frequently, techs discover that a charger is out of order before the charging company even does. The pain is real. JD Power found 35% of EV drivers in Miami had visited a charger where they were unable to actually charge. In Denver and Dallas, that number was 29%. And other research found 28% of the chargers in the San Francisco Bay Area did not function properly. ChargerHelp collaborated with the federal government in developing a new standard that says chargers will have to work 97% of the time. We know that reliable charging infrastructure is a critical piece of a successful transition. Right there, you see the sign? I'm on the map, but it's not on the map. Losing a little bit of patience right now? Two years ago, federal lawmakers approved $5 billion to spur the construction of a national network of 500,000 publicly available electric charging ports by 2030. That would help fill the gap. But since the law passed, there's been a lot of plans, but few chargers. Hey, how's it going? Hi, how are you? Melissa Lott is an energy policy expert at Columbia University. So you can't just put a charger anywhere. You have to pick certain places and make sure the infrastructure behind it, all the stuff that's invisible to us on the day-to-day -day, is actually there and ready to go. And that takes time. To keep up with growing EV sales, experts estimate, in addition to all the private chargers at homes and offices, the U.S. will need 1.2 million publicly accessible chargers by 2030. Today, there are about 160,000, which means we'll have to build the equivalent of what we have right now every year for the next six years. Lot says when it comes to climate change, there is a lot riding on quickly building out a national charging network. The slower we go, the bigger the impacts of climate change that we're gonna see. The city of Los Angeles is taking a novel approach to closing the charging gap, installing chargers on light poles on city streets because the electric infrastructure, it's already there. At most, we'll have to change fuses or do um, structural retrofits. Michael Sangalang is the director of LA's Bureau of Street Lighting. So far, his team has installed about 725 light pole chargers and says the city's street lights can support a total of three or 4,000 more. We're gonna be that public option for people to have access to it on the right of way for everyone. I think we should go back over there. Charger. I mean, we're charging, baby. From the open road to railways, Brightline is a high-speed rail line in Florida connecting Miami and Orlando, and the company has plans to expand even further. Chris Van Cleef steps aboard the train that could be a model for the future of American transit. 
Thanksgiving week on Florida's Bright Line means a milestone, carrying its five millionth rider since 2018. The trains that can hit a top speed of 125 miles an hour have seen ridership jump 116 percent this year, and the company expects to carry 4.3 million passengers annually between South Florida and Orlando by 2025. It actually feels like Europe. Jack Fernandez takes it monthly between Palm Beach and Miami and says he'll never make that drive again. You can get work done. You can make phone calls. You don't have to worry about the stress of having accidents in front of you and the uncertainty. While the cost for public projects like California's high-speed rail have ballooned and are years behind schedule, Brightline built its initial service between West Palm and Miami in about four years on an existing freight line. Its newly opened second phase to Orlando runs along an expressway, which sped up permitting and construction. It will eventually extend all the way to Tampa. The company also has a near shovel-ready project running along Interstate 15 to link the Los Angeles area with Las Vegas, a $12 billion effort that could be ready in as little as four years. We're in the pay for it part, but we're very, very optimistic that we'll be in a good place on that by the end of the year. Brightline Chairman Wes Edens. Is there a world where the U.S. gets true high-speed rail? The world's going to get true high-speed rail with our Vegas project, 100%. So the, we think the trains will actually go in excess of 200 miles an hour. It's less a question of exactly the speed, it's more the time savings. There's no doubt that there are many, many corridors in the United States that would fit this bill where you're going to save people a considerable amount of time. So how much time do you save me if I go Brightline to Orlando from Miami? We think on average between one to two hours. Transit experts point to success in Europe and Asia as proof that high-speed rail can be successful, linking cities that are about 150 to 400 miles apart. But those projects will require significant public funding. We will never see high-speed rail without substantial public investment to build it, and we will never see it without a substantial public commitment to operate it. The bipartisan infrastructure bill set aside $66 billion for rail. We're putting our money where our mouth is, but when a private enterprise can play a big role in it, then those taxpayer dollars go that much further. While the nation's fastest trains lag behind those in Europe, Acela moves about 100,000 people daily between Washington, D.C., New York, and Boston. Amtrak's long-term plan, if fully funded, would look to add similar higher-speed corridors throughout the country by 2035. Traveling public really needs to see how promising rail is before they get excited about additional markets. They need to see more examples than the Acela. Yeah, so then we'll be able to see markets beyond that as well. We run about 100,000. Amtrak President Roger Harris. It's not just about distance, it's really about congestion because people don't want to be frustrated sitting in their car all day. Coming up, would you eat a meal cooked by a robot? This is Eye on America. Welcome back. Advances in AI could soon find their way into the kitchen, where some restaurants are already using the technology to prepare and cook meals for customers. Joy Benedict dines out at one restaurant powered by robots. Mm, still lumpy. It's long since been the vision of Hollywood. Come and get it. Robots and humans side by side. Real stuff? Uh, just for cooking purposes. Sometimes making things worse, fashion. sometimes better. You want a cup of jar with you? Oh, yes, thank you. But now, in the suburbs not far from Tinseltown, the dream of an AI restaurant is already cooking. It's called Cali Express in the heart of Pasadena. Is this the first time we've seen all this technology in one place? Absolutely. Vic Golick is in charge of the newest business on the block, a burger joint which brings a bunch of food-making robots into one cafe. For this burger, it would take about 120 seconds. There's a grill robot by Kachina and Flippy by Miso Robotics frying everything else. No human chefs needed. We can't get enough people to come out to work on fryers and, and grills and their dangerous jobs. And this uh, automation helps solve a lot of those issues that we're having. But inventors say the use of these robots isn't a true technology takeover. It's intended 
to help humans. I love the way, and I think a lot about how technology can work with people to make people's lives better. Rob Anderson is a co-founder of Miso Robotics, which started working on Flippy, the fry maker, six years ago. I mean, this is your baby. That, oh, it's super cool. The machine is already at work in some restaurants like White Castle and Jack in the Box. Flippy's really good at doing repetitive tasks, which is just operating the fryer in those dangerous environments. And that way the people uh, who work in the restaurant can focus on those human elements. Is it costing people their jobs? That's uh, not what we've seen. Um, uh, it's really here to, to help people. Flippy can make 250 pounds of french fries an hour. The burger bot, 100 patties, all without needing a break or a day off like its human counterparts. These restaurants are very, very busy at peak times and every second that gets added to somebody waiting in the drive through is, is a lost revenue opportunity for that restaurant. But it's not just tech chefs. A cheeseburger. The ordering system is powered by artificial intelligence too, no using problem. facial recognition software. I don't want things looking at my face or getting my fingerprints, like should I be scared of these things? Uh, we don't think so. So we, uh, we're very clear on the point that we're not doing any kind of surveillance. Every single time our cameras are going live and recognizing the user in the US, uh, you're always tapping a button or you're asking somebody to scan your face. And there will be humans here too, putting the finishing touches on your meal. But Kelly Express plans on only staffing two back of the house employees, a fraction of what it would take to run a non-automated kitchen. This is the start of a revolution that's happening on the restaurant side. Dan Ives is an analyst for Wedbush Securities. Statistics show that 62% of restaurants report being understaffed, and 82% of restaurant jobs could be handled by robotics. We expect uh, by 2025 that we're probably going to have one to 200 restaurants that will be primarily AI focused. And in a state where the minimum wage for most fast food workers will soon be $20 an hour, less people to pay can be a bonus for businesses. Once the minimum wage went to 20, that's the bell going off. More and more focus on spending on AI. Because look, that's inflationary. That's the problem. You can't necessarily pass all that to the consumer. It does reduce some jobs, but there's so many more jobs that are created with the technology as well as maintaining this technology. In fact, these robots at Cali Express are rented as technicians watch Flippy all the time through cameras. Truth is, I can't get my phone to work probably <laughs> half the time. Yeah. What happens if Flippy flips out? If for any reason there is Flippy's not working, they can kind of flip the barrier up and just cook manually uh, as they would normally. And as for taste? Is it going to affect the quality and the taste? I would say yes, in a good way, because now each burger is being cooked precisely the same way every time. Only time will tell whether robots take over all kitchens, but watching the first of its kind come to life is a tasty technical treat and another AI debate worth chewing on. Good. <laughs> Ahead, a beanless cup of your morning brew. That story's next. We close our show with an effort to make coffee greener. One startup has developed a cup of joe they say can offset the environmental impact of growing coffee beans. Jolene Kent takes a sip of what could be the brew of the future. In the heart of America's coffee capital, this 30-person startup is brewing up a radical new approach to your morning joe. There has to be a better way to get coffee. We have to be able to make coffee without destroying our planet. Otomo was founded here in Seattle by CEO Andy Kleisch in 2019. He says our daily coffee ritual has devastating consequences for the environment. Most people who drink coffee drink two cups a day, right? And if you're drinking two cups of coffee a day, it actually takes 20 coffee trees to support you for the year. So out there in the Amazon, there are 20 coffee trees just for you. So imagine that across New York City, like how many coffee trees there has to be to supply that entire city. It's, it's kind of mind boggling. U.S. consumers shelled out nearly $110 billion on coffee last year. That's about 300 million bucks every single day. 
As coffee demand grows, Kleitsch says it comes at the expense of virgin forests in places like Peru and Vietnam. So what we are trying to achieve here is a way to supply the coffee that we all need every morning, but without causing any further harm, without causing any further deforestation. And what we found is by using upcycled ingredients, we can replicate exactly the coffee that you drink today without causing any of the environmental harm. Instead of coffee beans, Atomo's espresso consists of ingredients most people would not associate with your daily cup. Date okay. pits, yeah. millet, yeah. fenugreek yeah. seed, and sunflower um, extract mixed with caffeine from green tea leaves. How did you arrive at this recipe? Yeah, when we first said, can we make coffee without using coffee beans? We really said, we should use ingredients that cause no harm. You know, and we should try to find ingredients that are typically thrown away or just not utilized and could we make coffee without causing any deforestation? So come on in. All right, this is our application lab. So this is a kind of a real intense extract. As we end up soaking them in a, in a, like a solution, think of it like marinating a steak. Atomo's replacement coffee could be a solution for an industry facing an existential threat. So large coffee companies have come to us and said that they see a looming problem by 2050 where there will be a shortage of coffee. Our goal is to enable coffee companies around the world to deliver a great coffee experience without using coffee beans. Kleitsch says that Atomo's formula is not only better for the coffee industry and the environment, it's also better for us. We're using, you know, fruits. We're using actual ingredients that have been proven to have health benefits and health, positive health impacts. He also claims that Atomo has improved upon the caffeine jolts that you're used to getting. How is it really different? Right, it actually, so the caffeine that we use takes longer for your body to, you know, to really absorb. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a, a longer period of, of heightening and then a slower decline as well. Inside the lab, the moment of truth. It's an Atomo latte uh, with oat milk. Enjoy. Cheers. tastes like coffee. Yeah, it's like a nice, nutty, creamy flavor. But how does Atomo measure up against Seattle's finest? Across town, we met up with Sam Spillman. She's the 2019 U.S. Barista Champion and a coffee industry veteran. I think it's like coffee in disguise almost. We did a taste test pitting Atomo against Powerful. Spillman's own Cafe Vita blend. Okay, Atomo Espresso. Atomo Espresso. Cheers. The taste, it's like chocolatey, you get some like graham cracker in there, some kind of acidity notes, like a tart cherry, um, but it's not coffee. It's, it's just a different thing. Could it become that? I could see this becoming more like coffee. It might not be ready to replace Cafe Vida's own gourmet coffee just yet, but it could be a viable alternative to big chain brands or to that bag of beans you're picking up at the grocery store. If you were to rate this latte one to 10. I think like six and a half to eight, depending on the milk that's being served with it. Oh my gosh. This is more coffee than I would drink in a week. <laughs> But Atomo has a long road ahead. The company can only make five pounds of coffee a week in the lab. We're early days, yeah, which means we can only supply one coffee shop with enough coffee for five hours of business. But thanks to $40 million of venture capital funding and a new factory, which they're going to call the Roastery, they're poised to significantly ramp up production. By April of next year, we'll be able to provide thousands of coffee shops with enough coffee for every day. And then about two years after that, we should be able to supply a billion cups of coffee. Those billion cups representing untold acres of forests that would otherwise be chopped down for our morning coffee fix. And according to Kleitsch, that's the real win. So for us to be successful, we have to make a difference in the world. That's my goal. Atomo is on a path to disruption. And if the company can scale up, it has grounds for real success. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.